Hello, this is the second video of a series entitled How to Tell Your Grandmother You're a Fundraiser. In part one, we identified three challenges to hesitancy you might have in telling your grandmother or your imagined grandmother, if you don't have one, that you're a fundraiser. The first challenge was, you know, our profession is poorly defined. The second challenge was fundraising is somewhat unregulated industry. And the third challenge is we're unclear personally about what our jobs are. This video is dedicated to trying to find solutions to these three challenges. So let's start with the first one. The fundraising profession is poorly defined. And we touched on this in the first video. It's not lotteries. It's not tax avoidance schemes. It's not hard coercive marketing. So what is it? Now, I'm going to start and start by defining it quite narrowly. And I apologize because I'm making gross generalizations. But please, let's see where this leads us, this thinking. And we have to start with the donor journey. And this, the donor journey always starts at one simple place, and that's the desire of someone to support a charitable cause. So here's the donor journey. I'll take you through it quickly. It starts with initial engagement. Somehow, some way, there's an engagement with an individual on behalf of an organization. And there's an initial gift the first gift. And if we're good, we get recurring gifts. And after a while of the donor journey, this could lead to what we call leadership gifts, which come out of the annual fund, but are, are larger and usually case focused. From that point, there can become major gifts, which are significant gifts that have significant impact and finally, the estate gift, the gift from assets after the donor dies. So if we look at this journey and we start to use it as a, as a sort of a, a baseline for defining our profession, let's keep these things in mind. The steps to the left of the chevron are usually the result of direct response marketing. Whereas the steps to the right of the chevron are what we call philanthropy, where there's individual personal attention. Some other things to keep in mind, those to the left almost invariably are mission focused. And those on the right, the first two on the right are case focused. It's not no longer the whole mission those gifts, those larger gifts, tend to be more focused on a particular case. Surprisingly, generally, not always, but generally, the estate gift is mission focused, really because of the, the vagueness and indefinite nature of a future need. Keep those in mind. The other thing is these two steps in the philanthropy side require capacity. People have to be able to, to write a large check, transfer a large gift or a gift in kind. However, let's keep in mind that the estate gift is not wealth contingent because we're, if those are gifts from assets. Much research has shown that people of all wealth levels have the same propensity to make that gift. The size of the gift depends on the wealth but the willingness to make the gift is pretty equal on all wealth levels. There is a process on the annual fund side, we'll call it, if you will, initial gift, retaining the gift and elevating the gift. Uh, we start with 100% of people making that initial gift. If we retain 20 to 35% of people over time, that's considered good fundraising, okay? Uh, if we get 1% to 2% of that original group making a larger 
more focused GIF, that's considered ideal. Major GIFs are a little more complex because they can come from outside the organization, so to speak, but we'll say at about a half a percent, but 10 to 20% in most organizations would consider an estate gift. If you look at this donor journey, where does fundraising, if we're, if we're trying to more narrowly, clearly define fundraising, where does it lie? And I'm suggesting for our purpose, it lies here. This is what we call fundraising. So for the purpose of this exercise, I want to put forward a proposal that this is what fundraising is. So when we start to talk about our profession, let's talk about this as fundraising. The other, yes, fundraising bleeds over into these other areas, uh, these marketing-driven areas, of course. The real skill set of the, of the profession comes within this area. So that's how I'm, I'm redefining or more specifically defining fundraising. Before we find what the solution is to that challenge, how do we define our profession? I'm Ken. This is the YouTube channel, Empowerment Dialogue for Fundraisers, dedicated to empowering fundraisers to empower donors to realize their philanthropic dreams. In this channel, we will address all challenges and hopefully solutions to making us better at what we do. It's a collaborative effort. Please give me your suggestions and challenges, if you will, in the comment section. I'm getting them. Thank you. Uh, and please subscribe. Uh, then you'll be notified of the next the video coming up. And we're trying to spread the word and have this be an active forum for fundraisers. So back to the, the challenge and the solution. If the profession is, is clearly defined and we said it what it isn't, it's not lotteries, that's gambling, where charities may make some money on it. Uh, it's not necessarily tax avoidance. If that's a primary driver, and it can be, that's not fundraising, that's tax planning. <laughs> it doesn't mean that's not part of fundraising, and I'll get to that, but it's not the primary definition of fundraising what fundraising is. So what is it? Well, I'm saying it's facilitating philanthropic aspirations. That's what our job is. The, the donor journey always starts with a willingness to support the cause. Facilitating that journey, walking with the prospective donor or the donor as they move through that journey, that's what defines the profession of fundraising, wherein the fundraising participates in co-creating with the prospective donor to further the cause they care about and empowering them to do this as part of our best practice. How do we answer that challenge of what, what our jobs are, what our profession is? It's to redefine it and redefine it narrowly with focus. That's how you describe your profession to your grandmother. The next challenge is fundraising is a somewhat unregulated industry. And we're gonna to have to take a long look at this one. Uh, in many ways, our industry is only regulated by tax revenue authorities. How do the tax authorities regulate? They do it through uh, a system of tax credits or tax deductions. These happen to be samples of from various countries of standard receipts uh, with the correct information on them, the charitable tax, char charitable business number, whatever it's called in your jurisdiction that you operate in. And you might recognize these. These are from three different countries. That is the primary method of regulation, but it's quite limited. There is a complaint process in most jurisdictions. Uh, England, Wales, Northern Ireland has a charity commission with complaints going through the fundraising regulator. Uh, there's a complaint mechanism in the US in various states, most states through the attorney general's office. 
and in Canada to directly to CRA, directly to CRA, or some in some provinces through the public guardian. Those are the, the kind of complaint mechanisms that exist. The exceptions to this are gifts that have contracts. Insurance products such as gift annuities are regulated as, as if it's an insurance product. Trusts are regulated in various jurisdictions by appropriate authorities. And these are regulated heavily with strict guidelines and reporting. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about 90% of our business, which is just simply asking and getting from gifts. Again, organizationally, other bodies have stepped in. I'll give you a few. In the US, things like Charity Watch or Charity Navigator. In Canada, Charity Intelligence. And in the UK, Charity Clarity. You recognize those? They, they attempt to regulate our business by measuring our business as if they know our business. However, I think we all know if we work in the business that these measurements are simplistic and are wrongly focused. And there's been lots of discussion about that. At its core, it's because it uses self-submitted information with wide variations in standards. There's no consistency about that. They also don't measure the variance in impact. So that link to impact, which is a necessary part of the equation, is not measured because no one's figured a way to measure it. And because of the wide variety of charitable organizations, it's an amazingly complex sector. There is some voluntary self-governing regulation. Uh, and I'm thinking in Canada, it's the Imagine Canada pro program, but it's purely voluntary for some organizations. Again, at the organizational level, we're a large, organ a large profession. Here's some estimates. Canada, a $19 billion a year business. In the US, close to 500 billion. The UK, 11 billion pounds. There is a consistency. The nonprofit sector is close to 6% of the GDP. So a large segment of the economy, but basically unregulated. Fundraising is the only financial services industry that's not regulated in most ways. Here are some of the standards of other industries a very comprehensive directive of what information has to be given to prospects. Documentation given to prospective donors or clients. Consistent full disclosure of the use of the funds. In our case, the gift dispersion. It comes in many industries with the fiduciary duty to test for competency that doesn't exist in fundraising. Strict advertising guidelines. Those are some of the regulatory factors in other industries, but not in fundraising, even though we're this very large financial sector. At a personal level, anybody can work with individuals influencing their financial condition with no regulated training or accreditation. That's only voluntary no regulatory oversight, only voluntary ethical standards through our associations, no complaint mechanism at an individual level, and no necessary to be trained or under the guidance of experience leadership. So we're, we're floating around out there, and I always say, you can get a job one day. The next day, you're sitting down with a 92-year-old woman with enough competency, perhaps, or maybe not, to make financial decisions and walk away with a check for $200,000 that she can't afford. That doesn't exist in any other industry. We're going to continue this in the next video, part three of how to tell your grandmother you're a fundraiser.